2 Samuel 16, 2 Samuel, simple, simple message tonight. Sometimes the Lord gives you something, gives you the application to a message, and you kind of scratch your head and wonder, not sure why, but okay, we'll just go ahead and preach it. So I trust somebody needs this tonight. Maybe it's me, amen? But 2 Samuel chapter 16, we'll read from verses 5, from verse 5 to verse 14. Would you stand with me? And uh, let's read responsibly tonight. I'll help you with the verses. Um, so if you're up to it, if not, just follow along. 2 Samuel 16, 5. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. Together. And he cast stones at David and all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him, and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him, and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. We'll stop there and let's pray together. <coughs> Excuse me. Our Father, we thank you again for your word tonight. Yes, you. Lord, I pray that you'd please help me as I preach your word. You. Fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit. I pray that your word would go forth tonight with power and clarity Amen. and would have free course this evening. And so, Lord, I pray you'd give us tonight exactly what we need through the preaching of your word. May our hearts be open to what you have for us. Yes. And give us understanding this evening. Lord, again, I pray if someone's here tonight that is not saved, that tonight they'd come to know Christ as their Savior. Yes, but Father, for the believer, I pray we'd get a hold of this very, very simple truth this evening that we see once again in the life of David. But we ask your blessing and help tonight. We need thee. Help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Back in 2 Samuel 15, in verses 13 and 14, that David, the king of Israel, the man that was anointed by Samuel, the man that they anointed in Hebron and in Jerusalem, uh, this man that was chosen of God, uh, the one who has been on the throne now for about 20 years, made what I believe to be one of the most difficult decisions of his life. I do believe that. David chose to leave Jerusalem, to walk out of that city, to depart. We all know why he did it. It's his son. His son. His flesh and blood. Absalom. 
For some time now, we know that Absalom is, of course, David's third-born son. The one who was born out of a politically motivated marriage when David married the daughter of the king of Syria. The one who was the rebel of the bunch, the rebel of all rebels. The young man who did what he wanted to do, did it when he wanted to do it. A young man who would have nobody to tell him what to do. This man, this son of David, had been plotting and scheming to take away the throne from his own father. And he did this by working the people over. We know in first, uh, 2 Samuel 15, uh, I believe it's verses 1 through 6, uh, we see him working his plan. He criticizes his father and his father's leadership and his father's administration, if you will. He proclaims that his father was unloving and uncaring. After all, if he cared, he'd be here making the decisions and not be hard to find. He uh, wooed the hearts of the people. Uh, man, he worked it over, didn't he? Amen. And his plan worked. It worked. For we read in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 12, and the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. And here David is in a predicament. He's watching and hearing about this uprising and wondering, what do I do? How do I handle it? And so David, of course, I believe he, that he truly believed that the best thing for him to do at this time in order to avoid a civil war, in order to avoid innocent lives being lost, was to, was to basically pack up. Pack up his stuff and go. And that he did. And in 2 Samuel 15, verses 13, all the way down to the end of the chapter, we read of David's departure. And may I say, in my opinion, as we read of David's departure, that it is both a, a, a touching sight and a pitiful sight at the same time. Amen. You say, why do you say that, preacher? Well, touching in that as David leaves the city... Here comes this large group of people uh, from all over the place. Uh, 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 that people that loved David. Uh, people that were loyal to David. People that believed in David. Uh, and we find them uh, determined in their heart uh, that no matter what happened, uh, uh, they were not going to leave their leader. Praise the Lord. This group we know included David's family. It included David's servants. It's listed in the Word of God uh, as different folks in verse 18. The Cherethites, the uh, Pelotites, and the Gittites. The uh, 600 men and their families that had been with David all the way back uh, at the, since the days of, of Hebron and Gath. Uh, you remember those men that were there in Ziklag? They're still with David. Amen. And a man by the name of Ittai the Gittite. Leader, it seems like, of the 600. He said, I'm going with you too, David. And then comes this man by the name of Zadok and all the Levites. Evidently, he was a Levite as well. And they were bearing the Ark of the Covenant. They said, we're coming too. Count us in, David. Amen. Of course, we know David sent them back. But all of them and more desiring to stand by David. It's a very touching time. But then it was pitiful too. And you see this man now, this grown man, uh, walking out of the city? Can you see this pitiful sight as we think of it in our mind's eye? This godly man that loved the Lord. I believe David was a sensitive man. I think we get that from the book of Psalms. Uh, can you see him walking out of the city? I don't think he was running. I think he was walking. Can you see him uh, hanging his head a little bit, uh, uh, thinking about what's going on, uh, then making his way uh, down that hill uh, into the Kidron Valley, uh, and then crossing over that brook Kidron, uh, and then making his way up the Mount of Olives there, that slow walk, uh, and the Bible tells us, weeping all the way. Right. It's a 
pitiful sight. I, look what, I like what one Bible commentator said about this scene. He said, David's refusal to stand his ground when Absalom rose up in rebellion against him is to be attributed not to moral weakness, but to spiritual strength. David put others first. Amen. David knew what the right thing was to do for everyone. Praise the Lord. But it was touching and pitiful. Then last week we saw when David finally gets to the top of the hill and makes his way over that, that hill, he's, he's met there and approached by a man named Ziba in chapter 16 and verses 1 through 4. We know the story. Ziba the opportunist. Now we have Absalom the rebel and now Ziba the opportunist. Uh, he sees uh, David's situation and he takes advantage of David. He comes to David and he lies uh, to David about Mephibosheth, uh, all with the plan uh, to get and to steal and to obtain Mephibosheth's property. And David in his weakness gives it to him. It was sad that deceiving of David. Now, story's not over. More people are coming. David is going to be confronted here in our text by another man, a man by the name of Shimei. Nice guy, huh? We read it. Uh, here is this man, uh, uh, Shimei, uh, and David uh, is going to be berated by this man. He's going to be attacked by this man, uh, taunted by this man. I'll even go as far to say as being humiliated by this man. David is being treated in our text in a way that no king should ever be treated. Amen. But he was. So much so that Abishai, one of David's men, and we'll get into the details of the story here in a moment, wants to go over and take Shimei's head off. Let me at him. I'll take care of this situation. But David's not going to let him. Why is that? Because David doesn't see what's happening the same way that Abishai sees what's happening. Amen. Doesn't see it the same way. You see, Abishai is looking at life naturally, and David is looking at this scene spiritually. Amen. And so tonight I want to preach on this subject. The discerning of a king. The discerning of a king. Do you know there are two ways that you and I, for those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, there are two ways that you and I can look at the events that occur in our lives. We can see things one way is naturally. In other words, we can see things with, with only the physical side of things in mind. Seeing only the obvious. Uh, seeing only what's on the surface. Uh, and dealing with life uh, in the natural realm, if you will. Uh, and making decisions accordingly. Right. Or, we can see things with a spiritual eye. We can see things the way God wants us to see things. With the supernatural in mind, uh, seeing life beyond the obvious, seeing life beneath the surface, uh, seeing beyond the difficulty. And through the circumstances of life, uh, trying to discern the mind of God uh, and asking ourselves in every situation that occurs, uh, things like this, what is God doing here? What is God doing in my life here? What is God trying to teach me with this situation? What is He trying to show me? And then finally, what does God want me to do Amen. in response to this situation? That's the way we're supposed to look at things. But so many times we don't. You know, perhaps a good example of the natural thinking, even in believers, uh, this principle I'm talking about, would be Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Uh, you remember what happened that night in Gethsemane when the Lord's adversaries had come uh, and Judas leading them. Uh, they came into that garden to arrest him even though the Lord Jesus told him what was going to happen uh, there in that upper room uh, that he would be arrested uh, and eventually crucified and then three days later rise from the dead. Uh, yet when that very thing happened, do you remember what Peter did? He drew out his sword and he smote Malchus's ear off, thinking, I'll take care of this. He didn't understand. Right. Peter was viewing life naturally. You know, I see myself in Peter so often. And you do as well, I'm sure. Amen. We just respond to things almost in a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, uh, listen to the story. Let me just read it in Matthew 26. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Amen. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Praise the Lord. He's rebuking Peter there for thinking naturally. You're missing what God is trying to do. Amen. You understand tonight, and do I understand, that God wants us to see beyond the surface, see beyond the natural, and look to the spiritual if we are going to discern how God wants us to respond to situations and circumstances in our lives. Amen. And that's what we're going to see in David. So tonight I'd like for us to go ahead and look at this story and see some things in David that I believe God wants to see in all of us. All of us. Amen. As we go through this journey of life. Let's notice first of all, number one, the inaction of David. <laughs> the inaction of David. Notice his story. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, hey, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Can you imagine this crazy man? Throwing rocks at you and yelling at you. That's what was happening here. David and his small following, or maybe a little bit large, uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, uh, they've now crossed over the top of the Mount of Olives. They're descending now down that valley that leads to the Jordan River some distance away. And they come to a place called Bahurim. That's an unknown place. We're not sure. Archaeologists aren't sure exactly where that is. We know it's somewhere between the Mount of Olives and the River Jordan. And here comes a man from the family of the house of Saul. He comes and he begins to assault David. Now notice uh, his assault takes two forms, if you will. The first one is this. There's a physical assault. Again, look at verse 6. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. This Shimei begins to cast stones at David and David's servants. Now remember, Shimei is standing there, on I believe to be on one side of a hill, and there's a valley there, and I imagine David's on the other side, and his people there, and there's David in the middle of them. Now I'm sure that Shimei was not really aiming at David's servants. He was trying to hit David. But imagine here is Shimei trying to physically hurt this man. Can you imagine that? But there was also not only a physical assault, there was secondly a verbal assault. Shimei is also railing on David. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be railed against. You ever have somebody get in your face? It's not a fun feeling. I know some of you say, well, that never happened to me. Well, hang out with me a while. You'll find out. No, I'm kidding. But 
he says to David, come out, uh, come out, thou bloody man, and thou male uh, man of Belah. He's saying, you are the, you are the devil incarnate. Uh, you are a man of uh, the devil. Uh, and you know what's happening here? He's saying the Lord is returning all the blood of the house of Saul on your head. That's what he's doing. And Shimei falsely accuses David of stealing the throne from Saul and wrongfully becoming king. We know that not to be true. Amen. God called David and anointed him through Samuel the prophet. He's accusing David of a crime he never committed and he uses his foul mouth to curse David. David was in a very trying situation and all the while this is happening. What's David doing? Nothing. Nothing. That's not easy. Amen. Do you know what the flesh wants to do when someone gets in your face? Right. We want to get in their face. When they say something sharp to us, what does our flesh want to do? We want to say something sharp back. I mean, immediately the fleshly reaction to, to things, uh, especially to things like Shimei did, would have been to fight back. It would have been to take vengeance. It would have been to, to give him what he gave to you. That's what it would have been. Send some guys over there and take care of this man. But I believe David knew that would have been wrong. And I believe he, would, he knew that because of some of the things we read. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. The Bible says, Thou shalt not avenge, Amen. nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Same idea in the New Testament uh, where, where the Lord said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Amen. God is telling us here, Don't take matters into your own hands. Amen. Don't seek vengeance for somebody that hurt you. Proverbs 24, 29. Say not, I will do uh, to him as he hath done to me. Proverbs says, don't do that. Don't say, I will render to the man according to his work. I believe as David is walking there and the stones are flying and the curses are flying out of this man's mouth, I think everything inside of him wanted to do what the flesh wanted to do. I'd, I'd imagine that the word of God and the truths of God's word kind of rang in his head. And so what did David do? Knowing, what not, knowing not what to do, he did nothing. He did nothing. You know, there's a lesson here, I think. Do you know whenever, and I'm going to broaden the application here for a moment. Do you know whenever we are not certain what to do, if we, whatever the situation we are in, whatever decision there is for us to make, do you know if we are not certain what to do, if we cannot ascertain exactly what the Lord wants us to do, if we're not certain the path that God wants us to take, if we do not have the mind of God on a matter, do you know that the very best thing to do is to do nothing? Nothing. Now, I know that's not what the world says. After all, you know, you're the leader in the church. You're the preacher. What are we going to do, preacher, in this situation? I like to hear, see people's faces when I say things like this. I don't know. They go, huh? You're the pastor. Sometimes the Lord hasn't told me what to do yet. One of the hardest things for us to do is to do nothing and wait on God for direction. Amen. But that will only happen if you and I are discerning people. You know, so often if we're not thinking spiritually, we will do whatever the logical thing to do is. We will do whatever the knee-jerk reaction is to do. And we will often, uh, all of us fall into this at some time, we will make decisions without even seeking the leadership of God. Be careful. Amen. Be careful. 
You know, so often people have the idea, well, you're the preacher and you guys are on staff and you are the ones in the ministry, so certainly you have to seek the mind of God uh, more so than us. No, we all have to seek the mind of God for every decision in our, li in our lives. You know, perhaps the most frequent place that this occurs as far as this log thinking logically and this is just the way it ought to be is in one's employment. And I say that because of this. You know, some people, if they're offered a job that pays more money, they think, well, it's logical. It pays more money. Therefore, I'm going to take it. That may not be the will of God. Just because something opens up an opportunity does not mean necessarily that it is the will of God. Uh, uh, they think, well, after all, uh, you know, I can use more money. Hey, and then we try to spiritualize it by saying, well, I can give more. And I can be more involved in faith promise. Uh, and after all, uh, more money means God wants me to take it. Really? You're thinking naturally, not spiritually. And many do it anyway. Uh, uh, seeking the Lord. Uh, here's another one. Sometimes another place this happens is in relationships. Now you know my position and our position here on the dating game. We don't believe in that. Amen. We just think there's a Bible way to do things. We do. Uh, but, but the girl says, well, he asked me out and he's a nice guy and he's saved. So I guess I'll go out with him without even asking, Lord, is this the right thing to do? Lord, is this your will for my life? Lord, is this you leading me? Sometimes we do this natural thing also in making a big decision. I've seen people make some pretty big decisions without even thinking twice about it and seeking the Lord's mind on it. You should make, you should pray about these things, Amen. big decisions. Amen. I mean, where you're going to live, what house you're going to buy, whether I'm going to make this decision or not. So often we just think naturally, well, yes, I guess this is the way it's done. And you don't even seek God. You're going to find yourself in trouble if that's the case. Amen. Sometimes we do it with a large purchase, a vehicle. Or something big. Or another gadget that we think we need. And we don't even think twice about it. We just think, well, I want it. And we don't even pray. Lord, is this something you want me to purchase? You say, preacher, you mean I need to pray about everything? Well, yeah, I think you should pray about just about everything. Amen. I'm not saying you should pray whether you should have Cheerios or shredded wheat in the morning. But I'm saying when you're making a decision about something, you ought to pray about it. And seek the mind of God. Amen. But so often we don't. And if we don't get an answer, we're not willing to wait. Wait. Amen. I hate waiting. Anybody like waiting? Anybody? I didn't think so. I hate it. You know, Psalm 27, uh, let me read this to you, and verse 4 uh, says this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. If God does not give you clear direction on something, then you and I are to wait. Amen. Wait. Isaiah 40, uh, and, uh, uh, verse 31, a familiar verse. And let me get to it. I didn't mark it here. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Right? They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Uh, they shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. I read it tonight because this morning I butchered a couple verses up. And I didn't want to butcher that one up. They that wait on the Lord. Amen. It takes a discerning person to wait. Amen. When you don't have an answer from God and you don't know what to do. Don't do anything. Well, I have to decide something. You know, I have something going to go. I don't know what to do. What should, what should I do? Wait. Wait on God. God will give you clear direction. Amen. So notice number one, the inaction of David. And then notice number two, the temptation of Abishai. 
So here's David, and he's, this is going on. And he's probably, I would imagine he is battling inside of himself. I want to take care of this guy. I really do. Oh, this, I know God doesn't want me to do this, and I, I know he doesn't. Because his word says that I shouldn't do it. And here comes Abishai. And Abishai says this in verse 9. Then said Abishai, the son of Zer Zeruiah, unto the king, Zeruiah, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over. I can see him like this hulky guy. Let me go over and take off his head. Yeah. You see, Abishai is watching all of this. Do you see who Abishai is? Are you connecting the dots here? He is the son of Zariah. You say, who is that? Who is Zariah? Well, Zariah had a couple, of, several boys. He had three of them. And they were, they were wild men. I mean, they were tough guys. You say, who were they? Well, we read in 2 Samuel 2.18. And there were three sons of Zariah there. Joab and Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was as light uh, of foot as a wild rope. So Zariah had three sons. Uh, Joab, who was David's uh, captain, he was the same way. These boys were all the same. Uh, they lived of the flesh. Uh, they lived the natural life. They saw, here's a situation, and I'm going to take care of it right now. These are pretty tough guys. You remember what David said about them in 2 Samuel 3.39? He said, Am I this day weak, though anointed king? And these men, the sons of Zariah, be too hard for me. They were rough. You see, these brothers, they were not very spiritual. Uh, these brothers were kind of take matters into your own hands uh, type of guys. By the way, one of them was dead by this point. Uh, he was killed by Abner. That's a whole other thing I, I talked about earlier. And so Abishai says to David, I got the answer for you, David. In case you're wondering, I see you're not doing anything. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Why should this guy, why should this dead dog curse you? Let me go take care of him. I'm going to take off his head. You don't think that was a very tempting suggestion that Abishai gave to David? Amen. To the flesh? Amen. I mean, think about it for a moment. Hmm, let me see. Well, if he does that, that certainly solved the problem. I mean, you can't throw a lot of rocks without a head. I mean, you can't say a lot of things without a head either. So that would take care of it. I mean, imagine it. It would have been the instant fix, wouldn't it? It would have taken care of him. It would have gotten rid of this thorn in the flesh. It would have stopped David from having to think about it and hear those words again and again the whole way down the mountain there. It would have allowed David to move on to the next problem. Absalom, I got him to deal with. Now I got you to deal with. Man, take care of that. It would have lightened David's problem load. Would have been easy to say, yeah. That makes sense. But there was a problem. It wasn't God's solution. Amen. It wasn't God's way. Amen. You know, you're going to find out that when you're trying to discern things about what God wants you to do, maybe some decision in your life, uh, whether it be a big decision, a little, whatever it may be, something that you're waiting on God for, you're going to find that everybody's going to have an idea. Everybody's going to have a suggestion. Everybody's going to know what you ought to do. They are the authority on your life. Uh, and you know, some of their solutions may even seem like good solutions. They may even seem to make sense. And they may even seem logical or, or reasonable. But understand, uh, a spiritual person, a discerning person like I believe David was here, is not seeking any idea. A spiritual person will seek God's idea the Lord. and God's leadership. And if they're not sure the idea is not God's, they won't follow it. Amen. Do you know what one of the hardest things to do is? To discern God's voice amidst all the other voices. Amen. 
You know, 1 Corinthians 14, 10 says this, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Uh, everybody has an idea. Everybody, and, and you know, sometimes I, I tell folks that, sometimes I'll tell the staff, listen, let me, let me figure out God's will here on this thing. I, I mean, I'm open to suggestions, but this, you need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. You know what that does? That just throws a wrench in everything. Because I have to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want our church to do? What is it? Because there may be good logical things that we ought to do, but we're not looking just for the good logical thing. We're looking for God's leadership in everything that we do. And there's so many voices. Abishai's suggestion was nothing more than a temptation that David had to deal with. And David refused to take matters into his own hands. You know, we have a God in heaven that wants to lead us in all of our decisions. He wants to direct us. And he says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. And the one thing that you and I have to do if we are discerning people is to discern the voice of God amidst all the other voices. Amen. You know what that means? You need to spend time in prayer. Amen. You need to spend time alone with God. We need to spend time seeking the mind of God and allowing Him to speak to our hearts and not moving until we're sure this is what God wants me to do. Amen. So we see, number one, the inaction of David. We see, number two, the temptation of Abishai. And then we see, number three, and we're done right here, the perception of David. And so notice in verse 10, after, after Abishai says this, David sees things totally different. And this is amazing what David says here. Abishai says, let me take off his head. I'll take care of your problems. And David says, don't do that. Amen. Look at verse 10. And the king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse. Watch what he says here. Because the Lord hath said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now this Benjamite do it? Notice, let him alone. Notice, let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him. Let him do it. Because I know what this is. This is God. Chasing me for what I've done. And I'm going to take it. And God will get me through it. Amen. You see, David realized that the easy solution wasn't God's solution. He took God's route of understanding and perceiving that what Shimei was doing was a part of God's chastening hand. Again, look at verse 10. The Lord has said unto him, curse David. Again in verse 11, at the end of the verse, for the Lord hath bidden him. You see, God didn't want David to fight Shimei. God didn't want David to take matters into his own hands. God wanted to allow this to happen so David would be molded and shaped into the image of God. Praise the Lord. Wasn't the easy route. But it was God's route. David simply trusted God to get him through this thing. And God did. Look at verse 14. We could say number four, the conclusion of David. And the king and all the people that were with him came. They ended up there. They finally got to their destination weary. And notice they refreshed themselves there. Here's my point tonight, and we're done right here. It's really, really simple. You and I have decisions to make in life. Don't take the obvious always. Don't not seek the Lord. God Amen. wants to direct us in everything that we do. Don't think I have to make a decision right away because here's a problem. It's not necessarily true. Now, sometimes if we're applying a principle, yes, we apply the Bible principle. But if we're trying to find between this two good things, sometimes we have to wait on God Amen. and let God work in our hearts to show us this is the way I want you to go. 
Because his way, although it may not always be the easy way, his way is always the best Praise way. The Lord. Amen. God help us as a church to be discerning people. Amen. Not just in the things we do as a church. You know, we have a lot of decisions going to be coming up with this property. And we want the mind of God. We want the leadership of God. You have things in your life all the time. What job do I take? Do I, do I do this? Do I do that? Do we move? Do we choose this house? Do we choose this? Do we go here? All of those things. Uh, you may have a difficult situation in your life. Pray and walk with God and, and get the mind of God that we might be discerning people. Amen. God help us tonight. Let's pray.